This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about Bitcoin's quote unquote bubble and carbon footprint. Bitcoin hitting $60,000 this morning for the first time, and it's really been showing good relative strength, especially versus the stock market. We've been seeing some weakness in a lot of the momentum names in the stock market. Nevertheless, Bitcoin has really been outperforming, and it really looks like it's decoupling from the stock market. It's beginning to follow really its own adoption curve. If everyone is buying Bitcoin, all these corporations, pensions, endowments, etc., high net worth individuals, billionaires, then this is going to uh, have make Bitcoin really have its own dynamics. Now, it's fun to uh, see all the articles. It's fun to see Bitcoin being the, the first uh, story on the Bloomberg homepage. And at this point, it's good to remind ourselves just how down on Bitcoin and how bearish on Bitcoin all of these financial publications have been over the years. And this is one reason you probably shouldn't even read them. They're so terrible. If you listen to them, if you take investment advice from Bloomberg or Bloomberg opinion pieces, you're always going to get it wrong. This was uh, when this this article about Bitcoin uh, definitively saying that Bitcoin was a bubble was published really at the bottom in December of 2018. Wall Street Journal is guilty of the same thing, labeling Bitcoin a bubble. The problem with doing this, and obviously a lot of individual investors uh, in my comment section are still calling Bitcoin a bubble, but of course they were calling Bitcoin a bubble at 15,000 and 20,000 and 40,000. And every time it would pull back, they announced that it was the end of the bubble. The problem with this is if you're going to have an investment thesis or a hypothesis, a scientific hypothesis, you need something that makes it falsifiable, as Karl Popper, the philosopher, would say. So at what price, if you're a Bitcoin bear, what price would you need to see on Bitcoin to admit that you were wrong? You know you hated it at 1,000, you hated it at 5,000, you hated it at 10,000 and 50,000. So what would it take to really falsify your bearish Bitcoin hypothesis? There have been a lot of people who've been saying Amazon is in a bubble and has been a bubble since 1997. And this is just not a very helpful way of looking at the world. The way financial assets work is they begin to price in future reality. This is what Amazon's very high PE was showing us, that it was uh, a company that was poised to take over the world in the same way that Bitcoin is currently eating the whole world. So if you hate Bitcoin, if you're watching this and you hate Bitcoin, are you really going to be bearish on it all the way up to 1 million? I know a lot of you will answer, well, Bitcoin just topped at 60,000. It's going to go straight down to zero from here, blah, blah, blah. This is what I see in all my videos. The comparison, I think, to the tulip bubble is inaccurate, too. When the tulip bubble popped, it never came back. Bitcoin has popped a few times and it's come roaring back, has always hit new all-time highs. And this looks a lot more like something like Amazon, where uh, tulips never came back, but Amazon popped between 2000 and 2002. And then it came, uh, came roaring back uh, five or ten, called seven years later, and began to hit uh, new highs again. You don't want to end up like someone like Peter Schiff, who's been bearish on Bitcoin since it was trading for just uh, a couple hundred dollars. Now, the uh, if we look at the stock to flow model, this is the one I've been following that's put out by Plan B. And I'll, I'll link to this, of course. We can see that Bitcoin is headed to a uh, million dollars in the next few years. I think we actually hit $200,000 by the end of 2021. This uh, this model, I think, is a little too bearish. His stock, his cross asset model, uh, shows that the next uh, the next price target really is two hundred eighty eight thousand dollars. You can watch my other videos about that. But all of which is to say, if you if you if your hypothesis is that Bitcoin is a bubble, you've gotten very bad results. If your hypothesis is that Bitcoin is going to track this model, and what we're currently seeing here, this model was published, I want to say, in March of, of 2019. So what we're seeing is out of sample data here. This model is performing extremely well in real time. So the real critique I've been seeing even more than that Bitcoin's in a bubble, because you can only call something a scam and a Ponzi scheme and a pyramid scheme and a bubble for so long. It looks like the latest attack against Bitcoin has been sort of concerted attack in the press and mainstream media, especially about Bitcoin's vast, quote unquote, vast energy usage and how it's really bad for the planet, etc. And I would encourage people who make this argument to actually be adults about it. We don't live in an ideal world. We don't live in a perfect world. We all breathe out carbon dioxide. 
we all need to uh, we need to use a car to get groceries and get to work, etc. So it's always it's never this black and white. And when you're critiquing a system, you can't critique it uh, against a, a a white background or uh, something something like that. You have to always look at the trade offs involved. We don't live in the the best of all. Uh, the best of all worlds and so you have to look at the 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 cost benefits and the uh the trade-offs so if you're against bitcoin you have to explain to us how exactly do you propose to transmit value secure value and send it around the world because we do now live in a globally connected world how do you propose to send money how do you propose to store people's savings and secure the fr- fruits of their labors whether that's ten dollars or whether it's ten million dollars. You can't just, you can't go back to previous systems. The rye stones that uh, on the the, uh, island of Yap that were used, these were a a form of hard money, but we can't go back to rye stones or something like that. So we we have to look at the trade-offs with the current system. And when you're talking about the carbon footprint of the Bitcoin miners, you really need to compare it to to the alternative. So what is the carbon footprint of the current financial system? If you want to shut down Bitcoin, if you say it's bad for the environment, explain to me how the current financial system works. This is this is how uh, money is secured, uh, value is stored, money is transmitted. We have these giant skyscrapers. We have people uh, who sit in traffic and uh, not as much anymore now that Zoom, meet, Zoom and remote work has, has taken over, but the amount of the carbon footprint of heating these buildings. And when you look at these giant financial districts, whether it's Hong Kong or Los Angeles or New York or London, you have a lot of people here working in offices that need to be heated, that have electricity, a lot of support staff, etc. And all of this, uh, call it 80% of this, is just a way of... Um, of securing the the current financial system and helping people to grow their wealth at a rate that's higher than the rate that it's being debased by central bankers through money printing. So this is the current system. This is uh, a very uh, a bad it's a bad system uh, for the environment, as we all know. If you're finding this video helpful, I'll just pause here quickly and say please hit that subscribe and like button. Now the other problem with this is that there's always one standard for you, just the regular person, and then another standard for the elite. And you see a lot of articles like this, how you shouldn't have kids because it's bad for the environment. Here's how to reduce your carbon footprint, have one fewer child, uh, live car free, etc. And this, this may be true, but the problem is that the people who publish these articles and the elites as well do not follow this as well. So you should have fewer children and you should give up your car, but Lloyd Blankfein can have three children and can have his private jets. Uh, Elon Musk, I'm a big fan of Musk, so I don't want to troll him too hard, but he has obviously uh, seven children. He's got some uh, pretty high IQ genes there as well. Uh, But this is is one problem with having different, uh, different standards. And even this, this even applies in Silicon Valley, where uh, smart people and especially rich people are allowed to have a lot of kids, but everyone else should give up their car and should try, if possible, not to have any kids. So when you're looking at the carbon footprint of the current financial system, you have to take into account the private uh, Gulfstream planes that Goldman Sachs just bought, etc. Why is this? Why is this so necessary for Goldman uh, to do work? Now, of course, they're doing God's work, so maybe maybe it's justified because of that. But this is the uh, the real trade-off. What's the carbon footprint of hundreds of skyscrapers full of money managers, bankers, lawyers, accountants who have to sit in traffic and pollute the air with their cars or the buses getting to work? And these are people who are just trying. They're doing good work. They're trying to help everyone stay ahead of the devaluation of the currency that all the central banks are doing. And so this is the crazy. This is the crazy system that uh, Bitcoin is being critiqued in favor of this existing system. I would also ask, as part of this, what is the carbon footprint of endless war? When you have the world reserve currency, you can't let. You have to make sure, especially if it's a petrodollar-based system, you can't let anyone 
not use U.S. dollars. So Saddam Hussein made the mistake of selling some of his oil for euros. He ended up on the cover of Time as a bad guy. I think he was a bad guy. He was obviously a brutal dictator. So this isn't to defend him, but this is just to show uh, what is required to keep the current financial system going. If someone strays off the dollar, especially a Middle East oil producer, you need to uh, you need to bomb them. And the total cost of the Iraq war, just the Iraq war, not counting Afghanistan as well, and the various other exploits over the years, $2 trillion for the Iraq war. So when people criticize the energy usage of Bitcoin, are they taking into account what it does to the air, to water, uh, to, to drop all these bombs, not to mention the, uh, the terrible human cost of this, the suffering on both sides uh, on both sides of the war. Bitcoin's critics refuse to examine these trade-offs. The current financial system, the fiat system, is incredibly wasteful from the perspective of human capital and energy usage. And you have a lot of people who benefit from the Cantillion effect, who get very, very rich on Wall Street. And what they're doing is something that Bitcoin does automatically for you. It preserves your wealth. It preserves your purchasing power. Now, the other trade-off I should say, though, is that I think there's a there's a basic assumption behind here that that using using energy is a bad thing, and I think this is just uh, is just a lie. If you if you have a very primitive civilization, if everyone lives in in mud mud huts, for example, like uh, Papua New Guinea, or I don't I don't want to pick on a particular place because there is something very beautiful about living uh, close to nature, etc. But there's also something very beautiful about having hot water and indoor plumbing and sanitation, etc. But I would say that these more primitive civilizations don't use a lot of energy. Advanced civilizations do use a lot of energy. Space-faring civilizations, which we are becoming, use even more energy. And this is something to be celebrated, not deplored. Obviously, we don't want to completely trash the Earth's atmosphere, but there are a lot of renewable energy sources we will eventually have a Dyson sphere that captures all the energy radiating from the sun, etc. There are ways, there's, there's basically an infinite amount of energy in the universe. This is not a problem. The problem is clean energy, etc. And where I have a problem is where some people set themselves up as the electricity police. And they tell you what you can do with your energy and what you can't do with your energy. Now, the internet itself where all these people publish their critiques of Bitcoin uses 10% of global electricity. I think this is actually a really good use of electricity. I love the internet. It's connected the world. It's made huge productivity uh, advances uh, possible. That being said, you could still, if you went and analyzed it, you'd probably find that most of the internet is is pornography, cat videos, memes, uh, silly little TikTok videos, etc., which of course have their place as well and can be very funny. But who is uh, who sets these people up as the electricity police? If you pay for the electricity, you should be able to use it for whatever you want. You can waste it. You can waste it. Uh, but the problem with saying someone is wasting electricity is that people, uh, some people would consider uh, watching cat videos a waste of electricity, etc. Uh, I happen, I happen to like them. But, but the real question is who gets to decide what you do with your electricity? And if Bitcoiners want to create this this um, new emerging financial system and it uses a lot of electricity. This electricity is being paid for out of real people's pockets. It's being paid for by the miners, etc. And someone uh, who's basically using the internet, uh, Mr. Justin Rowlett, who's the chief environment correspondent, is using the internet uh, to publish his, uh, his, uh, his screeds against Bitcoin. And maybe this is, uh, maybe the, his articles are a waste of electricity as well, especially if he's not going to consider the current financial system. So you have, taken to, to the uh, its logical conclusion, you have people who basically say like the whole internet should be taken down. Uh, like this article, for example, that the cloud is very, is very wasteful, etc. Again, this is, uh, I think in a free market, we can let the market decide what is useful and what is not useful. Right now, Bitcoin has a market cap in excess of a trillion dollars. So people who say it has no intrinsic value, it has no value, it has no use. Here we have a market. It's the freest market in the world. Bitcoin's not regulated. 
Uh, it's not, it doesn't have circuit breakers, it trades 24 seven, uh, et cetera. And this free market seems to be pricing itself above a trillion dollars. And so the burden of proof, if you're gonna say it's worth zero, really the burden of proof is on you. This has been an 11 year bubble. Bubbles don't last for 11 years. Now, uh, I don't have time to go into it in detail in this video, but I would also encourage you to just Google Bitcoin and uh, some of the sources that are used by the miners. There's uh, a big movement, especially in the U.S., to use uh, um, to to uh, connect with bit with uh, uh, oil and gas companies, and rather than having them flare their raw methane into uh, into the air, to use that to uh, to basically burn it, so you're creating carbon dioxide, which is uh, a little bit less harsh on the atmosphere than methane, and you're using this to to uh, drive Bitcoin miners. So there are quite a few renewable energy sources that are being used uh, by Bitcoin miners. I'll link to some of these uh, some of these sources, as well as obviously all the hydroelectric power that's used. Now it's not great for rivers and the fish, etc., to dam to dam them, but there are. Uh, I would suggest that the, the, the majority of Bitcoin miners right now are using stranded energy sources. They're using solar, they're using hydroelectric, and um, as such, or they're using stranded energy where it, it really can't, you can't build a pipeline that far away, or it's, uh, it's solar energy that can't really be uh, transmitted over long distances. And this is what's, what's powering the Bitcoin miners. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.